Hi. Uh, yeah. A wonderful afternoon to you, uh, in case it is an afternoon for you right now. And I hope you can hear me. I had a bit of a technical difficulty uh, just now. YouTube was claiming I was not streaming data fast enough, even though my client was telling me I was streaming data fast enough. And hence, uh, yeah, start getting the stream started had a bit of a delay. Sorry for that. And I hope everything is now working fine. And I'm uh, looking a bit over to the to the uh, live chat. So if you could just give me a thumbs up or down, if you're hearing me correctly and all that, that would be great. Also, I'm hearing myself over the headphones for some reason. Uh, so somewhere there is something still open. Okay, so I'm not, not just going to mute that because otherwise it's highly distracting. Okay, so now let's get this started for real. Okay, so. Uh, my name is Gina Heuske. Welcome to Octoprint on Air episode number 24. For those of you who are watching li this live, there is a live chat as usual on the <laughs> right uh, on desktop or below on mobile. Um, and during the duration of this uh, broadcast thingy, I will keep an eye on that and feel free to ask any questions that you might have or anything like that. And we will also have a dedicated Q&A section, uh, as usual, where uh, yeah, those of you who have submitted uh, questions before, and I think we have three of them today, uh, will get their answers as well. Yeah, the short outline, as usual, is I first of all quickly tell you what I've been up to the past uh, week since the last broadcast, then I'll tell you what the next steps will be, what we'll be working on next. Then we'll uh, have a quick look at the uh, usage stats uh, of the new tracking server. Um, I hope at least, because that was also giving me technical prob uh, problems earlier. Uh, I rebooted the server now and I hopefully will be able to show you something. But uh, yeah, if not, we'll just skip that and uh, um, do that the next time. Yeah, and then after that, there will be a short uh, Q&A section, as I said, and uh, then we'll wrap things up again. So um what i've been up to so first of all those of you who watched the last final segments will probably notice i apparently had a haircut it was about time <laughs> um apart from that i went to the 3d meet up in sweden <laughs> i announced that the last time that i would be going there it was from uh what was it again i think april 27th to uh, april 28th and I have to say that I had an absolute blast being there. I met a bunch of people, shook, shook many hands, uh, met, uh, met very uh, met met quite a number of people for the very first time that I had only known online and all that. And that was really great. Um, I also gave a talk uh, about the challenges of developing Octoprint on both days uh, in the morning, which. <laughs> but yeah, um, and it was recorded and uh, I will also get the recording at some point and we'll be able to um, uh, link to it on uh, the, the on the YouTube channel. So far, I don't have it. But yeah, once I, I once I have it, I will do that um, in case you want to see this talk, that will be a chance to do so. Um, yeah, and I finally also I, I got to meet uh, Scott from uh, Aka I think he had think he had from the Marlin project. That was really, really great because we only so far had communicated in tickets and all that. And um, so I got to uh, got a chance to really get to know him. And we talked a lot and basically bonded over running huge open source uh, <laughs> uh, projects and also had some very interesting talks about host and firmware interactions, which I think will be very, very, very good for the future. Um, yeah, all in all, this was a really long overdue meeting for me. Um, and I also met a bunch of other really awesome people. Um, as I said, uh, 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 yeah, there there were quite a number of people there and it was really, really fun. And yeah, as I said, I, I had an absolute blast. And if you sh should you ever get the, get the chance to go there or to any other kind of uh, three meetup from this family, so to speak, like Murph, like Earth, like what else there is, I think 3D Meetup UK is there, is also there, but that was already, I think, three weeks ago or something like that. So if you get a chance, I think you will not uh, regret going. Uh, I certainly didn't, and I can only recommend it to anyone uh, interested not only in running their own printer, but also seeing what other people come up with and meeting people and uh, all that. So that was really a great opportunity, and I'm very, very thankful that uh, the 3D Meetup Sweden invited me. 
and paid for my trip and all that because uh, yeah i just it was one of my best weekends <laughs> this year definitely yeah it also um uh, made me get my hands on a do it board uh thanks to the awesome people from do it who also were also there and we chatted a bit and uh yeah so now i have some hardware uh in order to debug any kind of issues encountered with octoprint talking to the web wrap firmware in the, in the future so this is really good uh i also got myself 3d scanned isn't this awesome uh, and no i'm not sharing these files <laughs> um but uh yeah that was really great and uh yeah after this experience i now really want to make it happen to get myself over to murph next year so wish me luck <laughs> that this will this will work out yeah so apart from uh having a wonderful weekend at three meetup sweden uh i also you might have noticed finally released 1311 on uh, may 14th um yeah it was a quite uneventful a stable release actually there were the usual update problems here and there reported on the forum which so far yeah rather felt like corrupted installs dying sd cards some weird network issues rather than any kind of actual issues with the update procedure or the uh, new release of course there might still be something that comes up but so far so good and i mean we've already been yeah, stay, uh, this release has already been out now for over two weeks. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm feeling very optimistic that it uh, is is it, it's working okay. And also based on the tracking data that I see, um, it looks really good. So uh, within two weeks, uh, we had more instances running 1.3.11 than were running 1.3.10. So that was basically the tipping point of the update procedure and uh, more more active print duration or more accumulated print duration was actually achieved within two days um, that was really nice to see so it, all in all it really looks like a successful rollout and um, yeah as expected the the work towards that took up most of the past couple of weeks of time so until 1.3.11 was out that was basically all that i worked on um, but once 1.3.11 was out I finally could get back on track with 1.4.0 um, and uh, yeah I've uh, worked some more on the new communication layer that I've been talking about. Uh, the newest thing is uh, that well so I needed a way to allow fine grain configuration of the new com layer of all these uh, bits in there and boops in there. Uh, the protocol layer and the transport layer underneath and uh, also protocol specifics and all that because everything is now more flexible you also of course have more configuration options but you also do not want to overwhelm people so i thought okay what what am i going to do the problem with the serial settings as we know them in octoprint is you have this this one big page with multiple tabs uh, containing settings of uh, of, of various uh, bits and pieces that make up the printer communication and this this always applies to all connections and this was something that i wasn't particularly happy about the past couple of years already because well you might have a printer that you connect to with your octoprint instance that, need, that needs slightly different configuration there than another printer that you connect to with the same octoprint instance i mean we already have printer profiles to allow something like that but the serial connection data and all that wasn't attached to the printer profiles and as I mentioned, I also needed some way to override certain settings and all that on connect. And so what I did is I'm uh, in the in the new com layer. I'm now also adding something that I call connection profiles, which will basically bundling the printer profile as we know it with the mechanical properties of the printer, the build volume size, stuff like how many extruders does it have, shared nozzle or not, all that stuff uh, with the things that are more relevant to the communication to the printer so which protocol to use use which flavor of the protocol to use so is it a marlin uh, firmware is it a repetitive firmware is it a um, wrap wrap firmware smoothie where what what else might be out there clipper of course <laughs> uh, uh, replicate so yeah basically we now can um, have custom flavors for all of that and you will also be able to customize what uh, connection profile uses what flavor and what protocol is it is it rep rep 
G-code style, which is currently the only thing that is implemented, or will it be something else that someone might add through a plug-in? Uh, is it serial communication as we know it, or is it something like a TCP socket, stuff like this? Um, and all of this will be part of a connection profile. And uh, when you connect to your printer, you no longer have to select port and board rate and all that, but you only, ideally you only do that once and then save it as a connection profile and then you just click on the connection profile and connect to that profile. And that is the goal here. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's not much to see yet, but I still thought maybe you want to see uh, how that will look roughly. So the, the UI is not final yet and there are still some things that feel a bit too overwhelming that I want to solve somehow, although I'm not quite entirely sure yet how. But yeah, so um, I'm going to switch you over to the screen. Yeah, okay. So this is uh, a current version of the Devil Branch as it uh, is built, I think, yesterday morning, afternoon, something like that. And you see this whole area here looks a bit different than what you are known, uh, what you are, what you are used to, used to. Blah. Mm, you know this from me, right? My my me me uh, stumbling over my tongue. Nothing new here. Um, okay, so you have this drop down now here where you can. I still have to sort this by uh, yeah from A to B, A to Z, A to Z. Uh, but yeah, uh, you get the gist. Um, you have uh, a, a couple of connection profiles here, for example, virtual test. If you have to uh, do, to adjust something here, you can click there and then you get more properties. For example, we now have here have the printer profile default for this thing, but it could be any of these. Um, protocol is only that one. Firmware flavor, I can select one of these. And the transport layer is currently only the virtual connection to the virtual printer, but it could also be a serial connection, TCP connection, or serial connection over TCP uh, connection, which basically behaves like this one, but with this one, uh, yeah, not not that important the details here, but yeah. And what you also get here is this little advanced link. And if you click there, you get more. And this is the part where I think it's still overwhelming and I need to work on that. Um, you get more uh, options like should it always send a checksum, when to trigger an OK after recent and stuff like this. So all these protocol specifics that currently are hidden in the serial connection dialog, uh, serial uh, settings dialog, uh, will get uh, yeah will get a place here. Though as I said, I still have to figure out how best to structure this so it gives you access to all the data without uh, and, and all the options without overwhelming you. And um, the thing is that all of this here is generated from the um, from the protocol um, data. So, for example, you see also here transport virtual connection. If I switch to serial, then I also get an, a little advanced thing here where I can adjust stuff. Um, so all of this is these settings are I created the settings pages are created dynamically, and the goal is also that if you are um, long term if you are going to implement a plugin that pr provides a different protocol layer or a different transport layer, you can also yeah make the UI automatically generate these things for you. So you just define some stuff in code some settings and these get turned into all this stuff here. For example, you, you also see now that the com layers, uh, the, the com layers, sorry, the com ports are named. Uh, yeah, the baud rate stuff is nothing new. So for example, here I could define a host and a port name, uh, stuff like that. Yeah. So this is roughly the thing that I've been working on. Uh, or rather the, the, the more granular configuration of all this stuff um, is what I've been working on the past weeks because uh, yeah the the structure, this this protocol and transport distinction, all that, that is something that has been there for a while and this is something that I'm now finally also finalizing. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope that yeah gives you some kind of idea of what the future will hold. Um, and I hope that this, yeah, as you see, it works. So, I mean, it, it's only the virtual printer now, but I've also tested it against uh, a real printer and I've printed with this uh, stuff already. So it works and it is very, very, very much more extensible than what we have right now. And 
Uh, I'm really looking forward to experimenting with this stuff once I have basically mirrored the current behavior um, of, of yeah all the functionality and all that of the current com layer. Uh, then I also start experimenting with stuff like decoupling the whole communication with the printer into its own process to get around the current limitations that we have with Octoprint and all the printer communication and all of that running in its in, in one single process and only being able to run in, in uh, one on one uh, CPU core. But yeah, this is something that first I have to get this thing feature complete and then I can uh, embark on the next journey basically. But yeah, this is where we are at. And uh, now you can also finally click stuff, which previously wasn't possible, but now it is. And I'm very, very happy that this worked. And also, yeah, you can also, this is still linear, this will go. Um, yeah, you will probably know this from the printer profiles. That, so the idea will be that you will also be able to, of course, um, mark stuff, mark your connection, your default connection profile, delete the connection profile. Currently, this isn't implemented and hence not, not here, but you will also be able to edit that stuff here and uh, maybe, or what, 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 not, not maybe, but long term, I also want to be able to share these things so that you can have a printer profile and a connection profile for a Prusa or something that then works just out of the box and all that. But yeah, thoughts only right now, no, no actual implementation of this kind of stuff. Right. Um, yeah, and also see it's, it's, it's looking a bit different now, <laughs> everything, but it's working back to myself. Hi. Um, yeah, so this is things that are happening, uh, in the background and which will hopefully long-term make the whole, uh, Octoprint package more adaptable to all that, what is happening on the printer, on the 3d printer market to new firmware forks, to new firmware, firmware flavors, all of this stuff. And, um, yeah, also make it hopefully a bit more, uh, yeah, trivial long-term to figure out the correct settings for specific printer model and connection type, uh, with the connection profiles. Yeah. So this, this is the idea of the, the, the rough 50,000 foot perspective here. Um, yeah, I hope that was a good insight. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, something that I also did next to uh, the first, uh, the, the continued work on 140 was also the first steps towards uh, 1312. So the next maintenance release, uh, thanks to some uh, reported bugs and uh, by, by you guys. And also um, uh, the one or other thing that I found in the new error tracking that I put into 1311, in which some of you have enabled. Um, I was able to identify some issues and fix them already. And yeah, so they are now pushed to the maintenance branch and basically just waiting uh, for when I'll package up 1312, which will be a long, a long run from now because so not definitely not under two months, more like three, probably, uh, because as I mentioned last time, I really want to concentrate more on 140 now. And uh, the only way I can do that is to drastically reduce the amount of work that I put into maintenance. So maintenance releases are going to become a bit more sparse in favor of hopefully finishing all this work on 140 and being able to finally, uh, yeah, push out a first release candidate for that. So that hopefully we can push it, push the stable release sometime early, yeah, late this year, or if push comes to shove early next year. Um, which we must because, uh, yeah, I mentioned this in a, in a couple of episodes before, um, Octoprint 1.3 isn't, uh, 1.3x, so 1.3.10, 1.3.11, 1.3.12 and so on is, is not compatible to, uh, Python, uh, 3. Python 2, however, is going to become end of life in, uh, early 2020. So on January 1st, actually, I think, um, that doesn't mean it will stop working on your installations. It only means it will no longer get updates. And this, of course, means that, uh, yeah, it's now really, 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 really uh, um, five minutes to midnight, basically, to get off uh, or, or to get become compatible to Python 3 in order to be able to um, 
continue to to run with current Python versions, which actually is also something that excites me a tiny bit because uh, there are a couple of interesting language features that would make my life a lot easier in very, very uh, many instances um, that are Python 3 exclusive. So once I can leave Python 2 behind, that will also mean a couple of new nifty stuff becoming possible development wise, which so far hasn't been. But uh, this is going to be something for Octoprint 2.0, basically, because the minute that we drop Python 2.7 support, we basically become backwards incompatible, which means uh, a major version increase. Yeah. Okay. So much for all the techno, uh, techno bubble. Um, uh, what are the next steps? So I already indicated, I obviously want to continue with the current speed on 1.4.0 and uh, finalize the connection profiles, uh, f make the whole new com layer uh, feature uh, uh, achieve feature parity with the current com layer for the new com layer. And once I have achieved that, I will probably merge it down. Uh, well, first I will do some more test prints, then I will merge it on the devil branch and then see the, uh, what happens with when some more people who run the devil branch actually use it. So this is the current idea. And once that is done, then there are a couple of tiny other bits and pieces that I want to put into 140, but this, this will be the biggest one that needs to be tackled. So when that is out, I am I will already feel way more uh, confident about a final stable release. Yeah. Um, and also, obviously, uh, regarding 1312, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to fully concentrate yet now on, on maintenance, but when I see bug reports popping up, then I will, of course, continue to fix them. And uh, once uh, enough stuff has accumulated that it warrants a new release, then I will look into uh, pushing that, but that will probably not be in time uh, for the next, um, next installment of these broadcasts, but rather uh, after, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, now I'm going to switch back again to the right screen uh, because I promised you a quick look at the stats and this is only now for the last seven days and I'm kind of afraid to switch to the 30 day view because this is what caused the whole server to come crashing down earlier today. Um, then again, the seven day, seven day view isn't this interesting. So I, I, yeah, so just wish me luck. Um, we're going to try this now and it will take a while because it has to crunch a huge number of, a uh, huge amount of data and um, maybe I, I'll, I'll look into scaling up the server at one point, I'll see. But uh, yeah, that would be really nice if these queries now would work out and not produce errors again. Ooh. Yeah, well, we can, wh why this stuff is loading, we can take a look a bit at the data that is already there. So as usual, you'd spread across the world. Ooh, it's updating. Um, the usual stuff, most people print on the weekends, during the week, in the evenings, uh, in UTC, which surprises me actually, because I would have figured, ah, look, 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 hey, it's actually, apparently, not crashing on me today. That's awesome. Okay, so, uh, that one isn't, is, and that one isn't behaving either, but we'll just ignore that for now. And this one is still loading. This is actually the one that I wanted to show you, because uh, this really shows you Perfectly, perfectly how the upgrade procedures went as does, as does this one, but both of those are still loading. So, so not, 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 not many changes compared to the last uh, time. Uh, we are still roughly at 50,000 instances seen over 30 days with 200 years of printing time seen over 30 days. So this is very consistent now for a couple of months, actually. Um, uh, the usual stuff, more printing on the weekends with a bit more happening here uh, seems to I know that at least we had a bit yeah great yeah I think I have to look a bit more closely at the server and what is up there but you get the idea um, uh, here we had uh, a bit of a, uh, of a of a public holiday in Germany uh, I'm not sure about and, and also I think in the rest of Europe I'm not sure about the US but still 
I, I think the US had something here, right? Well, in any case, you see more people printing not only on the weekend all of a sudden, and uh, this is something that I find fine, uh, find f uh, fairly fun to see in these graphs. And well, this this graph didn't want to uh, um, didn't want to behave now, but at least we get the printed hours per version over time. And here you see um, one three eleven was released on uh, the fourteenth of May, and this is when the printed hours start jumping up and well people who print often apparently also update quickly so uh, we had uh, version parity around here and then whoop, since then oh look the graph recovered so perfect timing um, we also see this very nicely here so release was here then everyone and their mother basically upgraded at least until 10k and then it took a bit longer until it overtook 1310. And this is really nice to see because this is stuff. Also, this is a logarithmic scale, just in case you were wondering. Um, uh, this is really nice to see. And this is, I, I can't stre uh, stress enough how how helpful it has been to finally have these these numbers and, and this data to, um, to, to fall back on during releases and also dur during release candidates because, yeah, it's it's so helpful to know that there are already 10,000 instances out there who have updated to 1311 or something like that uh, 24 hours later and then you know okay apparently it's working and the reason that you're not hearing anything from people complaining or something is not because no one is testing it but simply because apparently it's working so this is great i'm really happy about this even though it sometimes yeah has request errors i'll have to investigate why that is um, maybe scales are up a bit which uh, yeah would not be optimal because more costly, but I think it might be running at its limits here. Yeah. All right. Um, that was a quick look at the stats, and now we'll quickly jump over to the Q and A. Um, taking a look at the live chat, but there is nothing in there right now. I think. Nope. Perfect. Okay. So uh, as I said. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, as I said, we had three questions. And the first question is uh, from uh, Christian. He asked that in German. I translated it as good as, as, as well as I could. I hope I did the mean did get the meaning correct. Um, how could one build a resume after pause in G-code or at a specific Z height for a filament change in Octoprint? So I wasn't completely sure that I understood what he wants to do correctly here because uh, he asked to put a resume in g-code instead of a pause in g-code and i would expect if you want to have a filament change you will put the pause in the g-code and do the resume manually um, so i'm going to talk about that here so um you basically have two options for that um there is uh, yeah a ton of firmware these days uh, the more modern forks of marlin and of course marlin mainline and repetia i think as well and smoothieware and all that so check check your firmware but there is this command now called m600 which does a firmware controlled filament swap so it moves if if, if you send an m600 to the printer uh, it moves the printhead out of the way uh, to a configured uh, park position unloads the filament allows you to load new filament and then when you hit a button on the controller it moves the head back and uh, everything is fine the problem with this is um, first of all, the, the the good thing about this is the firmware takes care of everything, and you do not have to, uh, yeah, record positions and all that and stuff. And yeah, the, the firmware knows where the head is. The firmware knows the temperatures. The firmware knows the current feed rate, the current selected tool, and all that. So so all of that is taken care of you. The problem is that, as I said, you have to press the button on the firmware controller, and, and yeah, the the firmware basically blocks during this time while an M six hundred is active. Um, and uh, you have no way to, um, I mean, you obviously cannot remotely swap your filament because this is something where you have to be physically present. But once you have swapped the filament, you cannot, um, uh, okay, I, sorry, there was a question in the live chat. Now we get to that in a minute. Um, and now I lost my train of thought, crap. Uh, <laughs> um, 
Right. So uh, you, you, you have to physically press a button on the printer controller and the printer controller also just blocks. It doesn't tell you anything like, hey, please swap the filament or stuff like this. So you have to know that because the printer is now blocking, it means you have to swap the filament and all of that. Uh, all of that. Um, the alternative to doing this is using something like the the add commands that are built into Octoprint. John, no, no, no problem. <laughs> um, uh, and um, one of those is the pause command. Uh, so add pause, and if you put add pause into your G code, Octoprint will not send that to the printer, but instead read it itself and run a pause. Uh, or, or execute a pause, just as if you had clicked on the pause button in the UI. And if you have set up Octoprint's pause and resume scripts accordingly, so that it will record the position and move the printhead out of the way and all of that, then you can basically mirror this whole M600 functionality, but with yeah having full information by Octoprint about everything. Um, and yeah. And uh, both these add commands and the custom controls that you would probably also need in order to execute the filament change itself through Octoprint, if you want to do that, uh, and instead of uh, clicking manually on the extrude and, and retract commands and all that, uh, the, all of that is documented at docs.octoprint.org. Yeah. Um, Okay, so now the question from the live chat, John asks, while you're working on com layer improvements, could you add an auto reconnect option with a timer, say every 10 seconds? So when a printer is switched on, Octoprint will automatically reconnect within a few seconds. Um, it is something that I've actually thought about. Um, the problem is actually um, um, reliably identifying the printer. So the thing is, when you switch on the printer or when you plug in the printer, then usually a serial device will pop up. And chances are high that if you only have one printer, this is your printer. Uh, but if you have another printer, the, the serial device that pops up might be called the same. So for example, you have a you have a Prusa Mark III and you have uh, an Ender III. And both of them identify, I'm not sure if this is correct, but just Bear with me here. Uh, both of them identify as dev TTY ACM zero. So how is Octoprint supposed to know which of the two is what what was just connected? And this is a bit of the problem here. Um, of course, you could just say, okay, we will use the um, we will use the default uh, connection profile in these cases. But yeah, I mean, would be an option. I'm not completely sure. I want to have this as a core feature though. Uh, because of these problems that could arise with the wrong connection profile being used or the wrong, wrong uh, printer being detected. Of course, with the, with the, with now the new serial uh, stuff now actually reading the device names and all that, we have a bit more chance to correctly identify a printer, but yeah, not necessarily that big of a chance. So as I said, I'm thinking about it and I'm not completely and utterly uh, decided against it yet, but I also see some problems with it. So this is something that I still have to think about a bit more, see if it's possible, see if it's feasible and see if it's reliable, first of all, because uh, yeah, the last thing that I want to add is some functionality that only works in very specific, well-defined lab conditions, basically, um, because yeah, I pretty much already have that or, that, or had that, uh, well, still in a way have it with the auto detection of the serial port, which tries to put, if you have more than one serial port on, on your, on your uh, server and uh, tell Octoprint to try to auto detect your printer, what it will do is iterate over the serial ports and try to put each one into a uh, programming mode. This is something that I still inherited from Cura from, from back when Octoprint started out as a fork of that and basically uh, pretty much of, of the Cura machine code. And um, the problem with this is, of course, that not all controllers can be put into uh, auto detect mode, which is why this auto detect stuff is a bit flimsy. And in hindsight, I really wish I hadn't even kept it in and just removed it years ago, but now it's a bit late for that. So I'm trying to figure out better ways to do it. Um, yeah, but yeah, this is a good example for a feature which is in there now and doesn't work reliable and it's causing me some trouble here and there. 
anyhow, uh, I hope this answers the question. I don't have a definitive answer yet, but at least you now know my train of thought. Um, so next question by Sebastian. You mentioned that using G-code for 3D printing is more hack than an actual solution. Slow text based, no dual checks are acknowledged, uh, used also as a protocol, but without specs, so with different implementations. I'm building a firmware, Marlin based, and I struggle with that. If I take the initiative to specify a new G-code and a protocol, would you be interested? So this is a really tough question for me to answer. Because in principle, I'm, I'm really interested in, interested to hear about such endeavors and I'm really excited to fix the current situation. Uh, but um, at this point, right now, as things are, I already have my hands completely full just trying to keep the existing variations, existing firmware vari variations that all claim to talk what we already have, uh, working and um, juggled and working. And I fear that adding another probably, I mean, I might be misunderstanding you here, but probably incompatible protocol next to that um, will only make it harder for me, basically. Um, and yeah, there's also a different problem here. So I mentioned, I think that I tried to, um, I tried to, to uh, um, standardize what we have and try to get people together to work on this and all that and was met with huge resistance a couple of years ago. And from what I see in the community, I'm not entirely sure that the people who are actually writing firmware and writing host software uh, and writing tooling for in between and all that. And also the more, yeah, the enthus enthusiasts that basically drive this, this whole ecosystem for us. If, if if this community is ready to replace place G code yet. Um, so yeah, I fear that that would really just introduce competing standards. So we already have this a bit actually, because there's this uh, binary Repetier protocol that Repetier host and Repetier firmware can speak. And I actually once read through that uh, because um, Roland has a documented I think in the firmware repository, but I'm not entirely sure where I found it. And um, yeah, it looks like a good solution and uh, has actually some interesting approach to various problems and is binary based, for example, that is really interesting and all that. Um, and yeah, I think this something like this would be a really good idea, but well, currently we have the situation that only his own software talks it. Uh, I actually want to look into uh, shipping Octoprint's uh, new com layer with a binary, uh, with an implementation of this binary protocol, but I'm not sure yet if I will manage to do it or if this is something that I'll have to ship later. I'm also not entirely sure if this still makes sense uh, because I'm not sure about the plans regarding this protocol uh, variant, but yeah, so this is tricky. Um, people are pretty hung up on the G-code stuff and love it and don't want to part from it is my my impression so far. Also, as soon as you try to add any kind of encoded stuff or something like this, uh, commands that, that uh, regularly provide data on the state of the printer, all that people really get, well, angry is not the right word, but they get really like, no, I do not want this because it would spam my serial console that I manually connect to, to my printer. And yeah, so it's a tricky situation and I'm not entirely sure that we are going to fix this very soon. Um, and if we do, it needs, it probably needs to be a huge group effort uh, with, yeah, very big players uh, agreeing, all agreeing on doing this and doing only this from then on, you know, in order to build up some pressure. At least this is my fear. So yeah, I'm, I would be interested to hear what you're planning to do. So feel free to uh, send me uh, a private message or, or, or get in touch on the forum or something, whatever is better for you. I'm not sure if what, yeah, how confidential <laughs> these plans are. Um, but uh, yeah, right now I cannot, 
considering the struggles that I already have, I cannot commit to yet another competing standard or to a competing standard at, at, in the first place. Um, not, not without knowing more. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, on to the next and final question, again by John. If I have version 1.3.11 RC3 running, should I replace it with 1.3.11? I mean, obviously, I'm now going to say yes, <laughs> but uh, actually, no, you don't necessarily have to. The thing is that 1.3.11 is fine. Uh, the, the stable 1.3.11 uh, version is pretty much 1.3.11 RC3. This is the whole goal of the release candidate, uh, um, after all, to have a packaged version of the software, which I hope to be able to, as is, take and use as the next stable release. Um, I do make some changes between the RCs and be even between the final RC and the stable version though, but those are just uh, metadata that is inside the package. So I update the change log, for example, so it has the release date and the full change log for the full version and not the individual change log entries anymore for the RCs. And I update the supporter list where the uh, people at $20 plus on Patreon are listed and all that stuff. So these things are different between 1.3.11 RC3 and 1.3.11 and also between every single last or final RC and the final version. Uh, but uh, this is all. So if you run the final release candidate version, there is no pressing reason for you to immediately update to the stable version other than me being very happy if you do, because it uh, shows me that the updates work <laughs> fine, right? Because I, even the final release candidate to the new stable version is also an update process, which can go wrong. And which is why I do a bunch of update tests during every single release cycle, including from the last RC to the current RC or to the next stable. Uh, from some older stable version, from various Octopi versions from before, stuff like this. Yeah. So, if if you are uh, if if it's a bad time for you, you don't have to. If you want to show me, hey, one three eleven final uh, is, is it's possible to update to that without any kind of issues from one three eleven uh, RC three as well, then do it. But otherwise, yeah, don't. You don't have to to get any kind of new features or functionality or anything like that. And that was the final question from our backlog. Um, I'm taking a quick look into the live chat if there are any new questions, but I am not seeing any right now. In that case, uh, I'm going to switch back to me. Hi. Um, yeah, in that case, uh, all that's left to say for now is, um, yeah, the next broadcast will be in roughly a month as usual. I know the last one was way before a month, but uh, stuff was a bit tricky. I'll try to do these as close to a month as possible, but sometimes uh, weekend plans and all that make it a bit more tricky. Since I try to do this on Saturdays to allow more people to attend. Um, so yeah, I'll do my best as, as usual. And once I've found a, found a good and, and working uh, appointment, I'll uh, post it on Patreon as always. And uh, yeah, those of you backing me at the $5 level and above will see it then and will be able to partake in this uh, live broadcast thing. And for everyone else, uh, I'll put the final recording of this one up within, yeah, hopefully within the next week, unless something else more critical uh, uh, demands my immediate attention. Um, and yeah, with that, uh, thanks for being here and watching. And I hope it was interesting and uh, you got your questions uh, answered, <laughs> all of those that you had um, and communicated. And uh, until next time, all that's left to say, I guess, is uh, happy printing. Bye. <laughs>